Last time we successfully soldered the EZ80 microcontroller onto a PCB and this time we're gonna go ahead and apply power to it. So suppose you have your microcontroller over here and your bench to power supply over here which outputs flat 3.3 volts. So applying power is easy, right? You just hook up the positive to the 3.3 volts and the negative to the ground and you wire these up so there are several pairs on the microcontroller that are already connected on the PCB actually so like that and you're done are you? well not quite you might be asking what's the problem here the power supply is outputting 3.3 .3 volts so if you have a good power supply it will never go over or under that and what could happen? the problem is in this wire here in reality this wire is actually an inductor it does not have much inductance but when current is flowing through the wire a magnetic field is building up and when the microcontroller is switching currents on and off that's causing a problem okay now let's have a look at the voltage on our supply here and how it changes when the current that's going through this inductor changes now let's suppose the current is changing due to internal switching of the microcontroller or because it is switching some load on the outputs the inductor does not care as long as the current stays the same so if we have a 3.3 volts here our supply voltage will be just fine in this part however an inductor does not like a change in current and how it reacts to that is actually by generating some voltage and the amount of voltage it adds or takes away depends on the slope of the current so when the f current is falling like that we actually get over voltage on our supply leads also if the current is increasing we get a drop so even though the power supply is outputting 3.3 .3 volts all the time we get excess or actually a lack of supply voltage on our microcontroller due to the inductance of the supply lead the problem gets even worse if you have a really fast switching device because the amount of voltage depends on how quickly the current drops or rises the solution however is easy just add a capacitor as close as possible to the chip across VCC and ground that way the inductor can dump its energy from the magnetic field into the capacitor also when the current is rising temporarily some energy can be taken from the capacitor okay now let's have a look at what a missing decoupling capacitor would mean in a more complex circuit like this transistor level representation of a triple five timer right now it's directly connected to a power supply and there's no inductance in the supply leads here and it's hooked up in a a stable configuration so it should be pulsing the output on and off and let's have a look what this does if it works so we hit run and get this simulation going and we will be concentrating on this part the output stage because that's where the most interesting things happen because here is where the currents are being switched and where we will get problems later when we add the inductance let's have a look at say these two transistors 
So this output can either source or sync current and while the output is high these two transistors are working in current amplification mode so it can source a little current and when the output is low this one actually ties it down to ground. And let's have a look what the output switching looks like. So we look at these base currents and also have a look at these collector currents and we will have a look at the supply voltage which is which stays constant at 5 volts at the moment and of course the output. So the output is switching on and off here and let's see what happens when the output switches off. So when the output switches off Q29 turns on while Q30 turns off and you can see in between there's a short time where both of them are on a little bit. That's when Q29 is actually having a collector current through it and this current goes through both of these transistors so there's a short moment where both of them are on but when that's over the current drops quickly from about 11 milliamps for each of them well it's yeah it's from 12 milliamps to zero within 20 nanoseconds so let's have a look at what this means when we add some inductance to our supply leads I have now added an inductor between the power supply and our circuit and I've calculated the resistance for a 50 centimeter wire of 0.5 millimeter copper and also the inductance and it's only about 750 nano Henry but this is enough to make the 505 do weird things as we will see when we hit one on the simulation. So when the output current turns off for the first time, that's happening here. So we get this moment where both of the transistors are on a little bit again, but once the switching actually completes, so th this one Q30 turns off and Q29 turns on, we get a drop in the current here of about 14 milliamps to zero and this causes the VCC voltage to rise to up to 6.5 volts actually. And this is what trips off the other parts of the circuit and actually causes the output to switch back again. So IB on Q29 drops as soon as we peek out here. Yeah. And IB on Q30 starts to rise again and they seem to go back and forth a little bit until they latch up in this this phase here where both of them are on but eventually it will yeah, it will stabilize a bit and then the switching off will repeat but again that will that switching off of the output current rises the VCC voltage and that trips off the other parts again and so it goes back and forth trying to switch off but it can't it's like when you when you like when you try to do some bowling and you got your fingers stuck in in the bowling ball and it takes you with with it that's basically the feeling <laughs> that the any 555 would have it tries to turn off the current but it can't because it's being dragged along by the inductance and that's causing it to do very weird things so now let's fix that by adding a decoupling capacitor. So we add the 
capacitor between VCC and ground. So we add the ground symbol here and just wire up our capacitor. And let's say we take just 10 nanofarads. That should be enough. If we do the simulation now, we get a little bit of action going on here, but the circuit is working. So it's turning off correctly and it's also turning on. So we can see that when the output turns off we get a little rise in the supply voltage but it's not rising that much because all the current now can be dumped into the capacitor. Also when the current turns on again we get a little drop but that drop isn't that much because we can now take current out of the capacitor even if the inductor won't allow for a quick supply from the source. So let's try if we can get away with a lower value, let's say 1 nano, and do the simulation again. Yeah, the spikes are getting a bit bigger. We're at about 5.1 now. So let's go down to, let's say, 0.2 maybe, 0.2 nano. and it's back into the weird oscillation mode again. This green one is the capacitor current now. At this point the capacitor is not, not helping much. It, it smoothens out things a little bit but it doesn't stop it from from oscillating in a weird way. We're still getting up to 5.5 volts here and it's, and it's actually increasing. So it's stopping it a little bit but it keeps getting bigger and bigger here, so 0.2 is not enough in this case. But if we add a really large value, say about 100 nano, so you can see that we have current going out and into the capacitor. It's just the charge going back and forth between the inductor and the capacitor. These two are doing their a thing and there but the circuit is not affected by that. There's very little, just a very tiny amount of ripple on the supply voltage. So that's how a de decoupling capacitor works. And here's what they look like in real life. As you can see I've tried to put the capacitors as close to the chip as possible. And there are also several methods to solder these kind of chips onto the PCB. And the method I'm using is very simple. First I take some solder and apply it to one of the pads, like so. And once that's done, I take some tweezers and grab the little capacitor, try and place it on there and once I got it in the right place I just reflow the solder that I put onto the pad and that puts the capacitor in place and then I just turn around the board and I do the other side like so and often after doing the second one I just go back and add a little more solder to the first pad if it is not enough I'm also using one of these regulators to generate the 3.3 volt supply directly on the board so I don't need a precision power supply I can just use a cheap 5 volt one and have the regulator actually generate the precision 3.3 volt supply for me. So this one is a switching type regulator but you could also use just a linear 7, 8 or 3 if you want. As you can see here, for the other capacitors I used a lot more flux which made things easier and I need to clean that off now. And next time we will have a look at the oscillator that generates a system clock and we will see the CPU alive for the first time. Until then, thanks for watching and goodbye.